kind of count up the the bizarre things that happened to me that probably helped um, me me be different. Uh, the first would be uh, when my father brought an Apple II computer home in 1979 when I was 12 years old and I fell in love with it and decided that's what I was going to do and you know so spent all my high school years when I should have been chasing girls you know writing code. I wanted to be as much like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak as I could. At 28 I uh, you know, I had uh, finished college and worked for, for a couple good companies and uh, kind of probably got to the point where I had done as much in programming as I thought was interesting mm -hmm. and wanted to figure out, you know, what I would do next. And, of course, the other thing about Apple that was important is that, uh, you know, Jobs and Wozniak were kind of insane. They just decided that they were going to build this thing that, you know, would create a new industry and kind of shape a wave and stuff like that. And I found that really, really interesting. Just, uh, you know, who's, who allows you to do that? Like, who, who gave you permission to basically, you know, cause so many problems for so many existing industries and so much, you know, goodness for, for a lot of other people? You know, that, that was pretty striking to me. But I really did like this idea of coming up with my own idea about how the world should work and then try to get the world to accept it. <laughs> um, and so, you know, my, my first company was this company called uh, Net Gravity, which, you know, uh, started in 1995, right as the internet started. And the theory was if all this great stuff on the internet is going to happen, somebody's got to pay for it. Uh, and there was no clear business model for anybody. And so my thesis was it would be advertising. And so we started the first kind of company to try to commercialize advertising on the internet. We did it through software, so kind of a um, management system that would allow websites to run ads, etc. And, and, you know, as you might expect, that was pretty good timing. And so we, um, you know, we went through four years and kind of uh, had a lot of success, took the company public. And, and, and again, I feel like that was all a little bit predetermined again, because you get the idea right, and you can execute, and like things go well. But, but then, you know, the interesting thing was we sold the company for, you know, way too much money. Uh, and and um, here I was at age 31 or 32 wondering what I was going to do with my life. At about that time, the Jesuits kind of reemerged. They, um, you know, they're incredible fundraisers, right? So you make a little bit of money and, and the Jesuits will find you. Uh, and they called me up and they said... Uh, uh, hey, John, how'd you like to help out your old high school? And I said, well, you, you know, you educate upper middle class white men primarily. That's not really a big cause for me. What else you got? And they said, well, that's, I'm glad you raised that because we kind of have realized that we've been a victim of our own success. You know, we educated all these immigrants 100 years ago, and now they're all really uh, successful. But we want to get back to our roots, and we're starting these middle schools um, for Latino kids, inner city middle schools that'll be tuition free. Would you like to help with one of those? And I said, that sounds interesting. And I had always assumed, I think, that to change the world at scale, you had to do it in the context of technology because technology is so inherently disruptive. But this was my first glimpse into the idea that you could um, change the world through things outside of technology. So this school clearly had changed that neighborhood within a couple months of opening. Just not just the kids going to the school, but the whole body language of the neighborhood changed. And again, it's like the random events that kind of shape shape you. Was that uh, an organization called KIPP um, was expanding nationwide at that point? Um, ended up kind of becoming the the founding board member for the school in Tennessee that the KIPP was starting. They um, clearly had a model that, from a business perspective for me, was wrong. Uh, great result, amazing human toll on the people that were involved with the school. And I just thought, you know, you might get 100 or 200 schools. You're not going to get 1,000 or 2,000 schools this way. So what would you do to try to get that result without just the massive amount of bloodshed that it was taking them? And so that was kind of the the thesis that, that I used when, when I formed rocket ships. So I guess these formative things like 
all the way from, you know, the Apple II and the Jesuits up through kind of fortuitously being in the right place on the internet to Vanderbilt to doing the KIPP school, like we're the precursors to doing what I'm doing now. So the thesis behind Rocket Chip is that, you know, education is kind of the only industry that hasn't been affected by technology. You know, even healthcare is just kicking education's butt yeah, I, in use of technology. And so the crystal of the idea is why don't we have a time every day where for every child what we're doing is completely individualized using tutors and technology. Wouldn't that help kids catch up? And wouldn't that be a more efficient and effective way to use kids' time, etc.? And so that turned out to basically be right. Learning Lab is the name of this thing and, and it has helped us Every year for five years, kind of move 90% of the kids in the bottom quartile of performance off the basic proficient or with any basically, or just eliminates the most difficult to serve kids by helping them work at their developmental level every day for two hours and getting the kind of intervention they need. So that worked. The other nice thing about it is that it didn't need to be staffed with certificated teachers because a lot of what we do in Learning Lab is either on the computer or a scripted tutoring curriculum and you need kind of a high school degree but not a lot more than that so you got $10, $15 an hour people working there who are overjoyed to have the job but they're not offended by the idea they've got a script and they're a heck of a lot less expensive than a teacher and we're able to substitute uh, the time in Learning Lab for time kids would normally be with teachers so we need fewer teachers. Um, and so that saves us about half a million dollars a year, which we then reinvest into the quality of our school. So not only does Learning Lab have the effect of um, helping kids who need it most advanced, but by having these extra dollars, we can pump it back into the classroom in, form, in the form of higher teacher salaries, uh, academic deans that spend full time supporting teachers and improving their teaching, just all the obvious things you would do if somebody wrote you a half million dollar check every year. We kind of we kind of do, and so the the real answer to Rocket Chip today is we have got this model. It works. We're the highest performing elementary schools uh, in California for low income kids, and we're ready to grow. It's a model that inherently is a lot more efficient. Um, and, and can grow, and so we're trying to use that to uh, bring into question the way the traditional school system has operated. And, and frankly, through a relatively brute force method, which is to take kids. Uh, you know, you, you don't want to adapt, that's okay, we're just going to keep serving more and more children. So, you know, in San Jose, for example, we uh, serve 2,500 children today. We received political approval last year to serve. Uh, up to 15,000 kids in 30 schools. Uh, and, and you can imagine how people who have kind of been playing the dance of, well, yeah, we're working real hard on your schools and we'll get back to you, how that affects them because, in fact, if they don't fix their schools, they won't have any kids left to go to them. So that, that's kind of the thesis of Rocket Chip is to disrupt by uh, doing something that works more effectively and then um, using it competitively against the existence of We had a child, his name is Santiago, and uh, he was a third grader, as I remember it. And in our world, you, you, you get these QM files. When a kid goes to school, if they get in trouble, like something gets added to their file. And like, you know, so you can kind of measure where a kid's at based on their QM file. And Santiago had a QM file I'd just never seen the likes of before. It was kind of two inches thick with just all kinds of things about you know, why Santiago will never amount to anything. He's a problem child and things like that. What we found very quickly was that Santiago was actually very smart was the problem. My guess is he's standard deviation or, or two above the norm and sitting in these classrooms with you know just um, not very high standards and he was bored out of his mind. He also is not very good when you don't have some structure. So the structure helps too, but you know, within a year of going to rocket ship, he, he had gone from, you know, basically this kid that was very clearly on the go to the special school for problem kids kind of path to being advanced in both English language arts and math. Um, and not only that, but what was amazing was his mother got very involved, ended up working at rocket ship and as ended up going back and getting her college degree. So 
you've got kind of this really wonderful story about a kid who, you know, in our business, it's kind of like you do what you do for a lot of reasons of the heart, but when you see kids like that, you know they're going to be in serious, serious trouble if somebody doesn't help them. So I, I like the Santiago story because it's kind of the extreme version of how our program can help a kid kind of figure their path out. I think uh, patience and thick skin seem to be uh, incredibly important characteristics. I mean, you know, when you're doing something in most of the rest of the world outside of social entrepreneurship, by and large it's a lot of hard work, but when you're successful, you know, people are excited for you and happy that you did what you're doing. In our world, uh, you do a lot of hard work, you have a lot of success, and people are really pissed off. <laughs> so uh, I think you, you really, uh, I think the reason that social entrepreneurship a lot of times is so difficult is that you really, really deeply have to believe that what you're doing is the right thing, even with a huge amount of feedback from the rest of the world, especially the current system that what you're doing is terribly wrong and often framed in moral terms. This is immoral because you're, you know, costing people jobs or, or whatever. So I think you have to be quite resolute that, in fact, the world needs this. My perspective is that you do have to care deeply in a way that may not be completely normal. Um, you know, because the, the people that I know that seem to be good at the, the, the things I do um, have an ability to tune out things that other people would care a lot about. You know, so I, I do think the thick skin thing is important. I think, really, the, the, the knowing clearly in your mind what things have to look like is really important. And I, I guess I'd say to a crowd of people who are trying to figure out is this for them, you don't kind of just wake up from a dream one morning and like it's all painted out. You have to make kind of an initial commitment that this is important enough that I'm going to flesh that all the way out, figure out what it's going to look like, and then, and then you can get there. And there comes a point in time, I think, in almost all startups where you kind of know that's right now. Like it's going to change a little bit, but that's basically the right answer. And for me, at least, when I get to that point, um, that's when it's very hard to go back. You know, you just you feel like you're letting letting people down if if you don't really try to try to finish. We employ a lot of um, kids right out of college. A lot of our teachers are young, and I always like talking to them about kind of why. They went to Teach for America or into teaching or whatever. And um, I really like that that generation, I think, has nailed what I think is, is a key thing, which is we've kind of gotten through version 1.0 of America. And, and maybe version 1.0 of Earth is it actually shouldn't be as hard as it appears to be for very, very smart, gifted people to want to solve those problems. Right? I think we have kind of a, a misalignment of incentives right now. If we want to solve the big problems, we better create enough incentives and enough structure that good people really want to go in and tackle those problems. You need organizations and structure that kind of push really good people into them. My kind of aha has been, we've got these huge problems. In some cases, we're starting to be able to channel people towards the right things with incentives and structures, but we seem to be a long ways away from getting that right, and we don't have a lot of time. And so I, I'm very hopeful that we see more and more Teach for America-like organizations pushing things across those sectors because, I, you know, for my kids, for my grandkids, I think we're pretty screwed if we don't get at least, you know, health, education, and environment energy right you know, in the next couple decades. And, and so the great thing about our teachers is they just seem to understand that. They understand we're at this kind of crisis point with version 1.0 and what's 2.0 going to look like and good people should help to make it happen. And I think we need more people to kind of have a full awareness that yes, you know, you may be doing a job of making a few hundred thousand dollars a year as a lawyer or a banker or a salesperson or whatever, but like, are you helping on that problem or not?
And if you're not, like, really kind of think, think, think inside yourself, like, is that, is this the best use of my time? 